Our next speaker is a titan in the industry, another dear friend of Chainsafe's, uh, founder and CEO of Ava Labs, Dr. Emin Gunsier, to discuss open and programmable finance with Avalanche. Uh, Emin, um, go ahead and uh, share your camera and microphone. I just uh, gave you broadcasting rights. How are you doing today? Very good. How are you? I'm doing well. We're very excited to have you. Very nice to be here. I, I, I'm not sure if I, I, I'm, I was trying to find out in the, in the panicked moments before this call whether or yeah. not I should have a slide deck available with me or not. Uh, whatever you'd like to present. Uh, if you'd like to share your screen with a slide deck, you can certainly do so. Uh, otherwise, the floor is yours. Uh, I see. So this is the format here is that, uh, that I do a presentation. So, yes. Okay. So um, then, uh, then let me pull up a, a slide deck and let's talk in general about Avalanche. Um, so, awesome. uh, uh, but, but please do give me a second because I, I wasn't expecting this. It's, uh, there was a small bit of an issue here. Um, Not a problem. So uh, I hope everybody is having a great day today. And uh, um, I hope, uh, uh, let's see, I hope everybody is, uh, is safe, sound, and having a great time. Um, I want to tell you about the coolest, biggest things happening in um, in uh, in uh, consensus protocols. Um, so uh, today was actually an interesting day when there was a formal analysis that came out that shows that the Ripple protocol is broken. And um, uh, that's uh, interesting when an academic comes in and, and uh, formally models a system and then says, hey, you know, even under the assumptions of, of this particular system, this given protocol does not, does not hold, to, hold itself together. So um, that's, an, that's an interesting outcome. Um, so uh, I wanted to tell everybody about Avalanche, about what makes it different. And, um, and so I finally got my slide up. And uh, let me get back to this Remo. And um, let me share my screen with you all. Um, let's see, my entire screen is fine, or rather Chrome tab. Um, okay, here we go. Okay, so uh, uh, let's see. So uh, I want to talk to you about, about Avalanche and what makes it different. I hope everyone can see this. Can you see this? I'm going to assume that you can and, and will look very silly if you cannot, um, but I hope you can. So I want to tell you about Avalanche. Um, and uh, so Avalanche is a, is a next generation decentralized blockchain. It is the latest in blockchain technologies at every level. It innovates not only at layer one, it also innovates at every layer above with uh, the smart contract platform on top, with the model on top, the network model on top, uh, with applications on top, and a whole slew of other things built on top of layer one. In this talk, I want to focus on the layer one itself, because for about the last 10 years or so, we got a glimpse of how the world could be so much better. And that glimpse came to us from, uh, uh, from uh, Satoshi himself. And um, uh, let's see. Um, yeah, so uh, uh, that, that glimpse came to us from Satoshi himself. He showed us what, what we one could do uh, with blockchains. Uh, but as you know, all of the existing blockchains have a terrible reputation. You go to anybody on, on in Silicon Valley, they're going to be like, hey, I work on systems that uh, handle millions of transactions per second. What's this thing you've got that, that chugs along at, at three TPS? You cannot possibly threaten world finance with something that can barely handle the traffic flow over the Brooklyn Bridge right in front of me right now. So, and they're right. Um, they also point out a whole bunch of other issues with how inflexible these systems are. And I want to talk to you about what makes Avalanche so hugely different from everything that came before it. At the core of this lies a new consensus protocol. Now, the thing is, it's incredibly trendy for every Jack and Jill to come out and say, hey, I have a new consensus protocol. It's like you can have a new hat. You have a hat, you put a feather on it. Now you have a novel hat, right? You put, and if there's an idiot out there with a, fat and a, heather, a hat and a feather on it, you put two feathers on it, or you put a bell on it. And now you really have a novel hat. So that's what people have been doing 
Justin Sun does this incredibly effectively, but everybody else is doing the same exact thing. They're announcing new protocols just by taking an old protocol and putting a feather on top. They take a protocol from 1999, PBFT, well known, and then they put slight, slight variations on it. You do PBFT slightly less efficiently than the original formation. You add a gossip layer to PBFT, you've got Hedera Hashgraph. And maybe they're well-intentioned, they're not even good enough scholars to realize that they're actually rebuilding something that has already been discovered. So, but that, that's what you're gonna hear from everybody. And that's what you're gonna hear from me today as well. And I hope that uh, by the end of this, you'll have at least some understanding of what makes these protocols different, that I'm not just one of the, the many people here jumping on the, on the blockchain bandwagon. Just for background, I was on the blockchain bandwagon before Satoshi was on it. I built the world's first proof of work based minting uh, cryptocurrency uh, back in 2002, 2003. It was published in 2003. So that's five years before, six years before Bitcoin came along. So, uh, so I've been here and uh, we am at the forefront of this technology and I want to tell you why this new consensus protocol is so amazingly different. So you can do all sorts of things with such a thing. You can do payments, transaction, computations, etc. But let me tell you a little bit about, about uh, how these systems actually work, what the other options are. My field, distributed systems, has only been around for about 45 years. This is not a, a, a very old field. Okay, so about 45 years, but and there has been a, a constant stream of research in those 45 years. So in that time, very, very early on, people realized that, that, cons that consensus is absolutely essential. And how did they realize this? Well, the, the beginnings of this field go back to DARPA, go back to the, the need for adequate missile defense. And so you're going to have your command control centers being taken out, and you're going to want to have a, a proper coordinated response. Either we all attack or we don't. But you definitely don't want to send, you know, a partial number of missiles over to Russia, uh, you know, in, in, in case you want to do something. You either want to go all out or none at all. You want to make a decision and that decision should be safe and live. That is, no matter what happens, the system must be able to take a decision. If a decision is taken, it's the same decision at every node. So this was a very, very early requirement and uh, consensus protocols have been worked on for many decades. Almost all of the work in that time for 35 years is in this one box that we call the classical family of protocols. This protocol family was explored by two people who are mentors and people I look up to, Leslie Lamport and Barbara Liskov. They both have Turing Awards, the highest award given in computer science. Everything else that came after that, um, so all of these things that you hear about, ETH 2.0, um, everything on EOS, etc. These are all variations on classical protocols. They're in the classical family. This family has some really nice features. Um, it's, uh, it achieves finality very quickly. So essentially these protocols are run by uh, selecting a set of nodes for a decision. So we pick something like a parliament. Uh, there can't be too many people in the parliament for a reason that I'm about to get to in a second. So we have these, these people in the parliament. Uh, we make sure that the supermajority of the parliament agrees with a decision that we're about to take. So we say something like, hey, I have a proposal, let's attack. And if enough people are supporting that proposal, uh, then, then we, can, we can potentially make a decision. It's not that simple. I have to know that there are enough people. You have to know that there are enough people. In fact, I have to know that you know, and then like you, everybody else, a supermajority knows that the supermajority supports the decision. That second part, that transitivity, makes it very, very complicated. If you leave a, you know, a first-year grad student on this task, uh, he or she will come up with protocols that, that require super majorities, but typically in that second part of this, uh, this thing, they, they falter and they come up with protocols that fail. And we've seen this uh, in blockchains as well. There are many failed protocols. In fact, as I mentioned this morning, there was yet another, uh, yet another discovery that a very popular protocol is actually, is actually broken at its core. So um, all these protocols in the classical family require precise membership. If I have 100 people, I need to know that a supermajority is in support of my decision. How do I know I have a supermajority? Well, I have to know everybody in the system. How do I know everybody in the system? Well, I have to have a notion of membership. Who's in my parliament? Who's making these decisions? 
And not only do I need to know this, but you need to know this as well. And you can't trust me to tell you because then I could lie to you. So you have to ascertain for yourself that there is enough uh, support for this decision. So the communication complexity is very large. Typically, it's quadratic. So what that means is everybody has to message everybody else or everybody has to have heard from everybody else in some shape or form. So people, uh, yeah, so anyhow, so that's sort of the, the bottom line of, of classical protocols is they don't scale well. The world's best classical protocol is a protocol called Hot Stuff that was designed a few years ago when my student, Ted Yin, uh, I sent him to Silicon Valley. He spent a the summer there. He is the first author on that protocol. And you know this protocol as the system, as the protocol behind Facebook's Libra, which just got renamed to Diem. So, um, so Ted worked on it for a summer, came back to me and said, hey, I built something cool. This is the best of its kind, but I want to build something even cooler. And, um, and we, just, we, we worked on uh, Avalanche together. I'll get to Avalanche in a second. But I hope everybody sees how these protocols work. They, the communication looks kind of like this graph. So if you type uh, classical cl BFD consensus into Wikipedia, you will see this graph. You're essentially seeing the communication pattern there. Every node is messaging every other node. That's what you see over there. And that, of course, creates N squared complexity. Hot stuff is designed to scale up to about 100 validators. So the idea is we're going to abolish the dollar, we're going to abolish the yuan, we're going to abolish the euro, and we will put in charge Mark Zuckerberg and 99 of his best friends. So that's a non-starter for me, and I don't know about you. Um, but uh, this is these protocols are not scalable. They don't go anywhere. So these systems have been used for permission systems. They're perfectly fine if you've got like your five friends and you want to run a somewhat decentralized, you know, tiny system. Um, you know, there was a there was there were a couple of companies that tried to to make a lot of money by coming up with permission blockchains using these protocols. Um, permission blockchains for different reasons. I'm happy to go into. They didn't really go anywhere. Aren't likely to go anywhere. Satoshi knew about classical protocols. He's, he's no dummy. He knew very well that what they could do and what they couldn't do. And he said, look, these classical things are fine uh, in some sense, but they're completely unsuitable for a digital currency at internet scale because of this need for precise membership, because of this robustness and because the, the lack of robustness and because of their inherent nature that leads to permissioned uh, permission, needing permission. So he came up with this system. You don't need to get a permission from anybody to, to join a proof of work chain and mine a coin. That's a brilliant, brilliant insight by Satoshi. And uh, this is the second big breakthrough in distributed systems in 45 years. It took 35 years of classical. Then uh, 10 years ago, Satoshi came by, almost 11 years ago today, I think, uh, Satoshi came by and, and unveiled this. It's, um, it's an amazing breakthrough, and it showed the world what one could do with an open system that's truly decentralized. The problem, of course, is this thing is high latency. A decision in Bitcoin takes an hour. You have to wait for it to be buried under many blocks. It's very low throughput. It's only three transactions per second, and it doesn't scale. There are only a few, hundred, few dozen participants um, mining pools in Bitcoin. If you want to actually have a say in the construction of the Bitcoin blockchain, you actually cannot, unless you own uh, an electricity cable that's at least this thick or maybe even thicker. Right? So, um, of course, not to mention <clears throat> this whole thing is wasting energy. It's consuming about 1% to 2% of world's electricity supply. It's not green. It's not sustainable. It's actively killing the polar bears. And maybe you don't care about any of that, but the whole thing is leaking $5 billion per year to the miners. So the store of value has become a leak of value to the power company. So Avalanche is different. It works entirely differently from the systems that came before it. It achieves quick finality. Uh, and by that, I mean it achieves immutability in about a second. I wrote two seconds on this old slide here. And uh, I'm on a, on a different laptop today, which is the reason why I couldn't find my slides earlier. So these slides are a little old. Um, so uh, in reality, as of this second, decisions take about 300 milliseconds. 
300 milliseconds is about a slow eye blink. Like that's about 300 milliseconds. So in the time I close and open my eyes, the system is capable of making a decision worldwide with, the, with input from all sorts of nodes, with input from hundreds of nodes across the globe. Uh, it achieves very high throughputs. So Avalanche can achieve 6,500 transactions per second. Uh, we just did this this uh, this deployment, and there's a movie somewhere uh, of of us achieving this in a real deployment. So this is not one of these puffed up numbers where somebody measured it on their own laptop or in a data center with huge machines. This is an actual number from an actual deployment across the globe. And most excitingly, I think it scales. Um, it's the fact that there can be 10,000 to maybe tens of millions of nodes inside Avalanche, and yet the system can still uh, operate with these performance parameters. I never thought I would live to see the day when I was a grad student learning about these technologies. I never thought this would be achievable. I was in the classical fold, and I looked at those protocols and thought, okay, these are very, very slow. Byzantine fault tolerance is an inherently slow process, and... Uh, and these uh, competing with Visa will never be possible. And you know what? Avalanche is three times faster than Visa. Visa achieves on an average day about 1,700 transactions per second. Uh, our system as it is can achieve 6,500. Now, to be fair, Visa can probably peak to 50, not probably, is known to be able to peak to 50,000 transactions per second. We cannot do that. So our peak is about 6,500 transactions per second but we can sustain that. So, uh, so we're in a very uh, interesting space. So yes, we cannot peak to Visa's peak levels, but we can outdo their average. And that opens up the field to a whole bunch of other things. Whereas Bitcoin is three TPS, we're about 2000 times faster than that. When you add that many zeros, it's not just a quantitative change, but it's a qualitative change. It's a robust protocol. There's no need for precise membership. It just works. I'll tell you how it works in a second. Um, and most importantly for me, it's quiescent, it's green, it's sustainable. If there's nothing to do, it just sits there, doesn't do, doesn't consume any energy. If there's a decision, it makes that decision in a flash. And uh, so that's, that's what's so novel and cool about it. So, um, what, so now what, what is actually technically interesting here for the, the wonky people among you who are interested in distributed systems? Well, it works differently than others. It's inspired by epidemics. It's kind of funny to be talking to you during a pandemic about epidemics, um, but you know how epidemics are unstoppable once they get going. So it uses some of those techniques from epidemic protocols and gossip networks to quickly come to a decision across the globe. And, uh, and at the heart of it all lies a very different approach to consensus. So any academic colleagues listening to this, uh, you all were, were educated in the classical fold you all know how to prove those classical proofs. Avalanche is a tour de force. It opens up a new way of approaching this. It has a completely different approach to achieving consensus based on metastability. It creates a metastable system. Now, you know, if you don't know what that word means, it refers to systems that don't like to be in intermediary states. Okay, I don't like to be outside these days, it's very cold. I'm either here at my house or I'm over there at my work. That's, I'm, I'm somewhat metastable when I'm outdoors. When I'm outdoors, I'm rushing to get indoors to one of those two states. And when I'm there, when I'm at my house, I'm actually very stable. It's going to take a lot for me to step out. That is a form of a, a very human version of metastability, if you will. Um, or if you will, to imagine, imagine a, 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 a hill. You can imagine uh, a ball. That ball is metastable on that hill. It's not going to want to be on any on the slope. It's not going to be one. It's not going to want to be at the very peak. Um, even the slightest breeze will send it going down. But when it's at the at either either end, when it's on the on the ground on the on the valleys, then it will stay there. Okay, so that's the kind of system we want to build. We want to build a, a distributed network that can quickly make decisions. Let me tell you how this protocol works. It's very simple. You can understand it. So imagine that we are, we're going to be making decisions, okay? Um, imagine that there are many of us. So let's say there are 100,000 of us, okay? And we're in a giant stadium and you don't know everybody in the stadium. They don't have names to you. They're just, they're just a whole bunch of faces to you as far as you're concerned and as far as I'm concerned. 
Uh, I happen to know some people, you happen to know some people, but uh, we're not going to be able to know everybody and the protocol doesn't require that. So now what are we going to do? We're going to make a decision. Let's make it simple. Let's make it between two colors. Okay, let's make it between uh, red and blue. So what we're going to do is, uh, is, is any given node, let's say take this one, uh, he will pick some of his friends, five of his friends in the audience and say, hey, I'm trying to decide between red and blue, and I know you are too, which one do you currently favor? So that's the question that goes out to these five. And they respond with, well, I like red, I like red, I like blue, I like red, I like blue. Okay, so that's their current preference. And, um, and if that's the case, then what this guy will do is he's gonna say, well, look, I sampled my audience, and my little sample indicates to me that the current decision is towards red. So he then turns red. Other people do the same thing. This guy also turns red and uh, everybody else is doing the same thing at the same time. Notice that something funny happened. This guy who was red, he's repeating the process and he might turn blue, but then again, he might turn red back again because red is gaining momentum here. So now if you imagine what could happen inside this network, the very worst thing that could happen is that the entire stadium is 50-50 split. And after one round of the subsampled voting process that I just outlined, you will see, or you can imagine, that it's incredibly unlikely that the network will be exactly 50-50 split. Just because of randomness, there'll be more reds or there'll be slightly more blues. Now, how much more? Let's say 51% more reds. And if that's the case, we're beginning to go down the hill because on the next round, 51% red means we are 51% more likely to increase reds even further. And that in turn means we're most likely going to go from 51% to 52, to 54, to 57. And before you know it, you're going very quickly down the hill where you know if 99% if of the network is, is red, uh, you can easily prove to yourself that the next round, um, we're going to have 100% of the participants going red or vice versa to blue. So um, that is at the core of this decision process. Nobody else is doing this. We were the first ones to note that this process is super fast, super efficient, and is the basis for a whole new class of consensus protocols. This is nothing short of a major breakthrough in science. It's the third biggest thing that happened in my area uh, of distributed systems when it comes to consensus protocols. So uh, this process can tolerate a large fraction of Byzantine participants. What does that mean? Um, these other protocols break down if 34% of the participants are evil or if 51% of the participants are evil. In Avalanche, that is not the case. Avalanche can handle even uh, attackers that are bigger than 51%. So we can't handle it with liveness. You can't be live, but you can maintain safety. The, the sanctity of account balances can be maintained even when the attacker is larger than 51%. It's an egalitarian ecosystem. You can join it and be just as big a miner, just as good a miner as anybody else. You could be the Jihan Wu of Avalanche tomorrow, and, and so can anyone else. Uh, my goal in life is to make sure that, that people can participate via cell phones, via applications that they run on their cell phones for true, absolute decentralization. And, uh, uh, it's the whole system works with maximal concurrency. It doesn't create just a single blockchain, but it creates a giant graph. Think of it as, uh, as making many decisions in parallel. And that's partly the reason why we can make, we can make claims uh, of the kind that I mentioned. Well, that's how we are able to beat Visa by threefold because we're not trying to do one decision after another after another. We're making many decisions in parallel using this system where a vote for one transaction is actually a vote for many series of transactions that led up to that transaction. And so that is, uh, is part of the magic that goes into Avalanche. Um, but that's not the only innovation. That's a major, major innovation, right? So if we think about this, the, the people who kind of came up with the classical framework, they have Turing awards. Satoshi doesn't have a Turing award. He has a billion, uh, he has a million coins approximately, uh, what, $20 billion right now. And, um, and Avalanche is the third biggest breakthrough. 
Everybody else will claim, you know, all sorts of things about their new consensus protocols that are just recycled classical protocols that they picked up from an old, in fact, from an ancient uh, uh, academic paper. This is genuinely new. But the novelty doesn't end there. There are many other things that we do differently. So one of the most exciting things is we're the only chain that, or only system that supports multiple virtual machines. Everybody else has this notion that they are going to have one coin, one virtual machine that defines how that coin behaves, and then one network. We are not like that. So how are we not like that? Well, first of all, we are a system whose goal is to digitize every asset. I am not here to say, hey, buy my Avax coin. I don't care if you do or don't, okay? Um, Avax is here as a facilitator for other people to create valuable assets on top. I foresee a universe where we're going to have many, many, many different coins. Every single thing we own should be in blockchain form. Why? Because that, that is the form that has the highest reach today. And that is a censorship-free way of, of owning things uh, in a digital format today. So, uh, but you can't, so, so first of all, it's not just about one coin. I'm not here to shill my coin at all. Uh, I'm here to enable other people to create coins on top. Now, those coins in turn have to have a way of behaving that is defined by the virtual machine. And that's why we support multiple VMs. We support not only the Ava virtual machine that allows people to create um, you know, basic coins, uh, but also we support the Ethereum virtual machine. We support the entirety of Ethereum. We're the only system that, as far as I know, has a current working copy of the EVM. And, uh, Sorry yeah. to cut you off, Evan. Uh, we're just um, we're, we're tight on time, so we're going to have to move to the Q&A section, if that's all right. Um, let me just wrap up then in that case. Absolutely. So Sounds good. We support, we support multiple virtual machines, and uh, we support multiple networks that come with them. And um, so, uh, so that way you can have a GDPR compliant, EU compliant, or US compliant networks uh, for, uh, for different people. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm going to skip all these performance numbers and, uh, um, uh, and I'm going to end right there and take questions from the audience. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Evan. That's great. Uh, your insights and knowledge of consensus protocols is extremely interesting. Um, we have a, uh, four questions in the Q&A. The first one being, uh, you have seen the evolution of blockchain and crypto over the course of your career. In your opinion, what does the next evolution phase look like for the industry? Um, we're going into a very interesting time. So uh, we're going to see, I think I called this in, in May, April, that uh, at the time when everybody was very worried about the pandemic, well, I was one of the few people to say, hey, we're going into an asset inflation bubble. And uh, we're going to see more of that with the coming second round of stimulus. So uh, expect uh, all of the assets, all, all stocks to, to go up, expect that money to overflow into crypto and, um, and expect the rising tide to raise everybody. Um, so that's what's going on. Uh, but at the same time, there's a transformation happening underneath. And in the long term, the systems that will remain are those that make technical advances. And uh, we are one of the coins that I think is currently uh, uh, is just emerging. We only went mainnet about two months ago. And uh, we are very, very excited about what we can do. We, have, we essentially subsume everything that Ethereum can do. We subsume everything that other chains can do. And... Uh, and uh, we have a flexible format that allows uh, enterprises to use us as well. So I'm really excited about, about that, that, uh, that uh, about where we are. Awesome. Uh, next question. Um, are these throughput numbers just value transfers? If so, how do they look with some sort of execution layer like the EVM on top uh, of the well? That's a very good question. So those are just value transfers. Those are actually realistic. Uh, they're not. So there are people in this business who uh, essentially make one bit decisions or, uh, or tiny one byte decisions. Uh, these are actual transactions with two inputs and one output, I believe, um, or maybe two inputs and two outputs. So they're uh, the, exactly the same as your average Bitcoin transaction. They're large and they have signatures associated with them and so on. Um, when you go to an EVM model and you start executing the EVM itself, then uh, there is going to be additional overheads not shown in that number. Uh, we are currently getting numbers that are on the uh, for a totally ordered EVM-like chain, we can do 3,000 transactions. But by the time you put it through the EVM code, then you go down to lower numbers. 
And currently we're rewriting the EVM to make it much, much faster. There are many decisions in the EVM that are absolutely suboptimal. Uh, it's just, uh, just, just, I don't know what they, what was going through their minds when they made those calls, but there are a bunch of calls that are really hampering the performance of the EVM. And we are rethinking that in, in entirely. Um, in a, while remaining in a, in a compliant, in a, in a, in a backwards compatible fashion. So I'm really excited about what's to come. Uh, we want to show the world what's possible. Uh, we showed already well, how much faster layer one could be with a rethinking of the most important protocols. Now I want to show people what you can do if you rethink the VM layer, if you rethink the database, which we also have done. Uh, we have our own database that's much faster. Um, and if you rethink the, the layers on top, so expect a, a series of exciting announcements in the coming year or two uh, that shows just, just how much faster these chains can be. Awesome. Thank you so much, Emin. It's been an absolute pleasure having you uh, speak today. Um, thank you so much uh, for the audience. Please go check out Avalanche. Uh, seems very promising. Thank you so much, Emin. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.